Canadian Armed Forces are not very big, only 83,000 men and women, but they are very professional, and they know who the enemy is. À date, je n'ai pas encore eu la chance. Un jour, j'espère d'avoir un sous-marin soviétique, mais dans des expériences et dans des exercices en décédant, j'ai... I'm hoping to see a Soviet submarine. In the last exercise, some of my colleagues managed to get a Soviet submarine in contact. But as for me, not yet. I'm hoping to, though. We've been preparing to fight the Russians for almost 40 years now. I expect that uh, a possible missile attack within the next half hour. If we didn't have the Russians as enemies, we wouldn't have armed forces like these. So most Canadian professional officers are enthusiastic about our alliances. I would not see myself as a Canadian destroyer commander, squadron commander, all alone. In a, in a particular event. It would be part of a much larger picture, uh, whether we were traveling with a carrier battle group or whether we were traveling with, with a large, uh, large convoy escort. There are certain situations where we'd expect long-range Soviet aviation forces to appear in the Western Atlantic, and indeed the opposition we would expect to meet uh, uh, would mount dramatically as soon as we tried to uh, uh, penetrate the Iceland, Greenland, uh, Faroes, United Kingdom gap which is where we get into the other fellows, what he considers his home waters. As to the, the score at the end, I hope the hell we never find out. The Russians have been preparing to fight us for almost 40 years too. We don't call it the Cold War anymore, but that's what we're still living in. And we no longer even remember how we fell into it. The Cold War was an accumulation of misperceptions on both sides. Um, there's no doubt about it. We were unduly afraid of their intentions. And they were paranoid about ours. And these worked on each other. It was a dreadful mistake. Every November 11th, we remember the Canadians who died fighting for us. They all died far from home, and the whole country has got an unusual habit out of that. We really do see our military efforts as a means of preserving world peace. That's a very good habit, but it doesn't tell us how to preserve peace. This film is an inquiry into how we fell into our present defense policy, especially in the early years after the Second World War, and whether the choices we made then were really wise. Ceremonies like this tie us to our past, and that's a good thing. But we remember our wars with all the emotions the country felt at the time. That hides the underlying pattern from us, and there is a pattern. The Second World War killed at least 40 million people, and it had gone nuclear by the end. The cost of stopping aggression by the traditional means was getting totally out of control. Besides, the last war was not simply a moral crusade against evil. It was a power struggle in which the strongest countries came out on top, as usual. This time it was America and Russia, but the strongest powers always see each other as potential enemies. Alliances collect around them, and it's the alliances that make world wars possible. This sort of thing has been going on for about four centuries now, and every so often the international system breaks down into a general war that drags in all the great powers and their allies, a world war in effect. Canada's been part of the alliance system from its foundation, so we got dragged in too. In every one of these wars, people told themselves they were fighting for something special, religion or empire, democracy or communism, but what the wars are really about is national power, 
By the Second World War, this pattern had become so obvious and war so destructive that the nations themselves began to look for a way out. In 1945, they created the United Nations. The UN was born from the wartime alliance of the Soviet Union, the British Empire, and the United States. It was an attempt to break the cycle of world wars. Instead of creating military alliances, all the world's countries would come together to prevent war and collectively stop any country that broke the rules. They called it collective security, and the victors met in San Francisco in 1945 to draw up the rules for keeping the peace. We started out, those of us who'd been through the Second World War, so horrified by uh, many aspects of it, uh, but the fact that it had spread to a global conflict. I don't remember approaching the UN with a, a doubts about its usefulness. The entire Canadian government was determined to make collective security work. No more alliances, no more wars. And in those days, Canada was one of the Western Big Three. The people of Canada are firm in their resolve to do whatever lies in their power to ensure that the world will not be engulfed for a third time by a tidal wave of savagery and despotism. Mackenzie King had a few private doubts about the UN, but Louis Saint-Laurent, his external affairs minister, was fully committed, and so were the bright young men around him. Saint-Laurent, I don't think, was quite as gung-ho as a lot of the young people, but he felt that uh, you had to have an international organization in order to prevent wars from happening, and he went along with Mike Pearson's view that that, should, uh, that organization should even have military teeth. Uh, Pearson had an idea that there should be a 200,000 man standing United Nation uh, army to which Canada would contribute. <laughs> we wanted to be a middle power which would be a kind of semi-permanent member of the Security Council. We said important military countries like ourselves ought to have this special position. Well, the trouble with that argument, we had to demobilize. You know, our boys had been away longer than anybody else's. You had to get them home. Everybody wanted to reduce the defense expenditure. And if we'd got some kind of semi-permanent seat in the Security Council on those grounds, we would have had to maintain an army of several hundred thousand or so. Um, so I don't think we really wanted to be a great military power. Right from the start, military questions overshadowed the UN. It was taking the Russians a long time to demobilize their huge wartime army, which made the Western countries nervous. And the Russians were obsessed with their total vulnerability to American atomic bombs. By a two-third majority of... I think the Soviet Union had pretty well made up their mind uh, that they had not been taken into confidence uh, by the Americans, notably, particularly, over the nuclear weapon. And they were working on it. And they wanted to achieve the capacity of a nuclear detonation, just as the Americans had. The U.S. had no intention of attacking the Soviet Union, but the Russians were not treated as full members of the club. When the three major English-speaking powers got together to discuss atomic policy, they didn't invite Stalin. After the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Mr. King came together with President Truman and Prime Minister Attlee to make this declaration that, uh, appealing to the world, that the bomb should be outlawed and that this, this new source of energy should be used for peaceful purposes only. Canada had done a lot of the wartime research on the atomic bomb at McGill University, and we had lots of uranium. America already had the bomb, and Britain would soon decide that it must have it too. Only Canada lacked the great power reflex. We could have been the second or third nuclear weapons power if we'd wanted, but we didn't want to build bombs. <laughs> 
what we were most interested in was the peaceful uses. We had a lot of illusions about that. But our scientists, the National Research Council people, thought this was a this was a new technology, and we were going to be in on the ground floor. That's what they were interested in. And um, you know why? Why would we have a bomb? We decided not to have the bomb, but the Russians were desperate to have it, and we were well worth spying on. In September 1945, Igor Gazenko, a cipher clerk from the Soviet embassy in Ottawa, defected. He revealed that the Russians were spying on Canada's atomic projects, and on Britain's and America's as well. The great powers were already falling out, and their quarrels were paralyzing the UN. There was the, the, the difficulty of dealing with the Soviet delegations. Our custom was, when each of us came back from a committee meeting, we would go to Norman Robertson's room to report on what had happened at that committee that day. And one time I had started to report, and he said, I wish to God somebody would come into this room and not start his report by saying those bloody Russians. The Western powers automatically won all the votes in the UN. The West had a huge majority in the General Assembly in those days. So the Russians wound up using their veto constantly. Wherein do you find any answer, whatever? The quarrels were mostly about Europe. Both the Anglo-American occupation forces and the Soviets encouraged the creation of governments like their own in the countries they had liberated. But the Russians had a much harder time in imposing communist governments in the countries they occupied. So they resorted to extreme measures. When the communists overthrew the Czech government, with Soviet backing, the Czech foreign minister mysteriously fell to his death from an upstairs window at the ministry. I felt a very chill wind of fear after the Prague coup, when the communists took over in Prague. For one thing, the uh, Czech leaders had been very well known in international circles and were personal friends, most of the Western statesmen. And the brutal end to democracy in Prague was a, a shock. And I think there, there was genuine fear then, if not of a sweeping military invasion which would, which would overcome all physical ob obstacles and occupy the whole continent, but of the whole thing coming unstuck through these kind of internal coups and through instability and, and post-war disillusionment. And uh, it was a very unsettled period. What really worried the West were the large and popular communist parties in countries like France and Italy. In 1947, Prime Minister Attlee of Britain came to Ottawa and told Mackenzie King about his fears of a communist takeover in Western Europe. The Americans still had a monopoly of nuclear weapons, so the Russians wouldn't dare invade, even if they wanted to. But something had to be done to prop up the Western European governments. Something like a North Atlantic Treaty. An iron curtain head. By 1947, as Mackenzie King listened to the news bulletins and read his dispatches, he was worried that another world war was imminent and he had no magic solution to the danger. He distrusted the United Nations right from the start, but he felt just the same about the idea of a North Atlantic alliance that would allegedly supplement the UN as the keeper of the peace. It aroused his habitual fear that Canada would get dragged into troubles abroad that were none of our business. However, by the time NATO came up, King was losing control of his cabinet. Saint-Laurent Pearson agreed to cooperate with the British. Canada and Britain set about seducing the United States into joining a formal alliance with Western Europe. It was Saint Laurent who first floated the idea in public. This veto privilege attacked and defended with equal vigor. If it continues to be abused, 
may well destroy the United Nations. Of course, it was Mr. Saint-Laurent's speech in, in the General Assembly which first suggested that if, if you couldn't get some kind of collective security arrangements in the United Nations, it would be necessary for those countries who did feel that they wanted to do something to get together in what we should call with collective defense. In early 1948, we and the British began secret talks in Washington. The Americans were very shy at first, even though we weren't asking for troops. For a long time, uh, we were referred to it not. We were really negotiating a treaty. We were saying we were discussing uh, common security problems. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't even admit that we were uh, talking privately uh, with the Canadians and the British about it. Our diplomats would have denied with their last breath that they were just going back to the kind of great power alliances that have produced so many wars in the past. This time it was different, and besides, NATO was only a temporary measure. Nobody realized that we were proposing to ride a tiger, or that it would be hard to get off later if we didn't like the direction the tiger took. We Canadians have come to feel so strongly the need of collective security. But if we are mistaken as to the Soviet attitude... The real problem was uncertainty. There was a pretty nervous period in Moscow. We didn't know what was happening, and everybody back home wanted us to tell what the Russians were going to do next. And then I remember one day the um, message from Ottawa saying they'd just discovered that uh, most of the women and children from the Soviet embassy had booked passage to Moscow. That was a rather chilling day. And... Um, it was simply because they were sending them all back to school. There had been some new decree saying the children couldn't be educated abroad. But all this uh, you know, encouraged suspicion. By the late 40s, the Russians were convinced that the Americans were going to attack them. Stalin was keeping the anti-aircraft batteries around Moscow on a 24-hour alert. The U.S. government had identified the enemy too, the World Communist Conspiracy, and was preparing to fight it anywhere in the world. And across the world in Japan, America's stronghold in the Pacific, the busy commies were at it again. Students went on a rampage in Tokyo with something less than successful results. But far more sinister to Americans was home front communism. Union Square in New York was the backdrop for these scenes of red violence. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives, should World War III be forced upon America. Underlining the menace from within. The NATO treaty was signed in May 1949. This treaty is a simple document. The nations which sign it agree to abide by the peaceful principles of the United Nations. I was present at the signing of the treaty. I remember Mr. Pearson stating the Canadian position, which was that this should not be just a military alliance, and that this required a consultation system which would uh, try and align our policies as far as possible. At the time when the signature was taking place, and Mr. Pearson had just made this speech, it happened that the uh, Marine Band that was deployed by Mr. Truman for the occasion struck up, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> <laughs> seemed rather appropriate comment. <laughs> Canada's diplomats weren't naive. They were already worried about the Americans' approach to their new role as a superpower. Privately, Ottawa didn't think the Americans could be trusted to be sensible. This is therefore, this is August 30th, 47. Our conclusion is that during the next 10 years, the possibility of the Soviet Union precipitating a war with the United States or blundering into such a war is remote. A war, if it comes, is more likely to arise out of panic in the United States, should there occur, as is possible, a steady increase over the next 10 years of Soviet power in relation to that of the United States. This is something which is a strain in Canadian thinking. I think it also a strain in the thinking of the Western European countries and the United and. Uh, the British from the beginning, that the purpose of the North Atlantic Treaty was not just to contain or restrain the Soviet Union, it was to contain or restrain the United States. <laughs> 
Our intentions were good, but we were really building a cage for ourselves. The Americans and the Russians each saw the other as a mortal danger, and the smaller countries were being pulled into the alliances of the great powers as usual. But even Americans didn't really see NATO as a traditional military alliance at first. It was just a political device to put some spying into the Western Europeans by guaranteeing that the American monopoly on nuclear weapons would be used to protect their interests too. NATO had no troops, no command structure, nothing. But within a year, the West became convinced that World War III was practically around the corner, and we all fled back to the solution that had failed so many times before the attempt to create a military balance of power. Korea had been divided into Soviet and American zones of occupation in 1945, and in 1950 the North Koreans invaded the South. The public, of course, assumed the Russians were behind it. I don't think, to begin with, that the Russians had very much to do with the outbreak of the Korean War. I don't know this for certain, but I strongly suspect that the North Koreans had been pretty badly aggravated by attacks by the South Koreans before they ever invaded South Korea. The U.S. immediately sent troops to back up the government it had installed in South Korea, and it expected NATO to do the same. The NATO allies weren't consulted about the American decision. They were told. It was not easy to make the decision that sent American boys again into battle. I was a soldier in the First World War. We were summoned to the State Department, and um, I remember that the NATO allies said, is this a consultation or information? And um, the, uh, I think it was George Kennan who was holding the meeting on behalf of Dean Ashton, or it may have been any Dean Ashton himself, he said, the President of the United States has informed Congress of the decision of the United States to take military action already. So you can draw your conclusions, gentlemen. It is for you to decide. They decided to go along with the war. Korea was the turning point where NATO really became a classic military alliance in the old style. Canadian warships sailed to Korea at once under the command of Admiral Brock, but we'd made no plans for sending soldiers abroad. We had to have troops and we didn't have them. So that it was a very embarrassing month in New York. Finally, and ironically, when the cabinet was assembled on the train coming back from Mackenzie King's funeral in Toronto, they decided to raise this special force for UN and for NATO, if necessary. And then they went ahead very quickly. Perhaps this explains why we desire to enlist as many veterans as possible in the special force. Men who know the score. The man in charge of raising Canadian troops was General Folks, the chief of staff. Larry Valley and the Hochwald. Well, when it was suggested after the outbreak of the Korean War that Canada should send a brigade to Korea and a brigade to Western Europe, I remember having a talk about it with Charles Folks, who was then chairman of the Chiefs of Staff Committee. And Charles said to me, uh, you know, the politicians think it would be difficult to recruit enough men to form two brigades. I've told them there'd be no difficulty at all. It's now uh, four years since the end of the war, and there are plenty of men who've now decided after four years that they've had enough of their wives and children, they jump at a chance to enlist. This brigade will be known as the Canadian Army Special Force, and it will be specially trained and equipped to be available for use in carrying out Canada's obligations under the United Nations Charter or the North Atlantic Pact. It's striking how many Canadians then talked of NATO and the UN as though they were the same thing. Self-deception played a big part in our drift back into a system of military alliances. To say 
But that problem is the great... But there was also deliberate deception, especially at the United Nations. While the Russians were boycotting the Security Council over another issue, the Americans got a resolution through declaring the Korean War a UN operation. In the Far East. The mere fact that uh, the United States was able to put a fast one across uh, during the absence of the Russians um, uh, and, and mount a, a United Nations action in defense of South Korea <coughs> Uh, enlarged the whole scope of operations and indeed in many ways increased the increased world tension because of the participation of so many other powers what r the Russian reaction to that was going to be we really didn't know we didn't know what the Chinese reaction was going to be we felt our way through this the American commander in Korea General MacArthur didn't stop at driving the North Koreans back where they came from he drove on north towards the Chinese frontier, the Yalu River, occupying 90% of North Korea. I, I, I used to quarrel quite frequently with General MacArthur out in the Far East because of his determination to go and dip his feet in the Yalu River. Uh, in my view, quite unnecessarily. I'm quite sure that the high-level bombers w weren't dropping all their bombs exactly on one side of the center line of a very sinuous yellow river. There were bombs falling all over the other side too, and so the Chinese came in. And they gave us a damn good thrashing. They just put a handful of rice in one pocket and a handful of bullets in the other, and they marched straight forward, knocking off the enemy ahead of them. And all our tanks and our air power and our sea power and the Coca-Cola machines and the, and the typewriters and the barber's chairs that we landed at Incheon and had to take off again a few months later uh, were of no help whatsoever. 312 Canadian troops were killed in Korea, and the front line eventually stabilized more or less along the pre-war frontier. But in a sense, it didn't make any difference, as Mike Pearson discovered when he paid a visit to Washington in June 1950. At the State Department, Dean Acheson told him the secret American strategy. It was startling. The U.S. didn't see Korea as strategically important, Acheson told him. It was just that war in Korea made it politically possible to get a quick increase in defense spending. What the Americans really wanted was to build up NATO's military strength in Europe. Korea was a sideshow. I think a lot of Canadians took quite a lot of pride in what was done in Korea. And having, having sent troops to a country a much farther away than Europe, and a place that we much less understood, uh, it was a lot easier to uh, 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 send our troops and our air force uh, into Europe. During the Korean War, defense budgets in all the Western countries doubled and then doubled again. Canada sent 10,000 troops to Europe and our armed forces tripled in size. They're still more than twice as big as they were when the Korean War started. By 1952, we had recreated the alliance system and the Northern Hemisphere was once again divided into two armed camps. And not a lot has really changed since 52 except the day corps. We're trapped in a time warp waiting for the next world war to arrive. But as the full meaning of what we'd done in our panic became clear, even NATO founders like Mike Pearson began to have second thoughts. A lot of Canadians still have remembered what we'd all once known, that alliances would probably lead us into another world war eventually. So men like Pearson started looking for some way to shift the emphasis back to the United Nations. Pearson's chance came in 56 when Britain and France invaded Egypt over the nationalization of the Suez Canal. 
What he did was to invent peacekeeping. I was with Mr. Pearson at the time in, in New York. Uh, what was on his mind was how on earth to get our dear British and French friends out of a mess and how to, in particular, to prevent the war from spreading. My delegation would like to submit to the assembly a very short resolution, a plan for the setting up, with the consent of the nations concerned, of an emergency international United Nations force to secure and supervise the cessation of hostilities. It came at a time when we were wondering about our place in the world, more and more concerned about being part of uh, an alliance run largely by the major power. It was comforting to feel that there was something we could do. Pearson's initiative mainly served to get two of our NATO allies out of a jam. But the invention of peacekeeping did restore a little credibility to the UN. The troops for the UN Emergency Force in Suez were voluntary contributions from various countries under the UN flag. Great powers were not allowed to participate. Only non-aligned nations like India and the Scandinavian countries and Canada because it was our idea. A Canadian, General Burns, was appointed to lead the Suez peacekeeping contingent. Mr. Hammershaw apparently recommended me to go ahead and nobody, no, nobody else was competing for it. <laughs> One uh, man who had been in the job before and had been assassinated, it wasn't really a top uh, desirability. <laughs> what was accomplished? Well, there was peace for a while and perhaps you could might say that there was something learned about how it might be used if the greater powers desired to keep peace. It is one of those cases where the Canadians felt good because here we were, the uh, very virtuous people who uh, had no colonial past and uh, uh, a good reputation throughout the world. We were the mediators, we were the peacekeepers. That was uh, our self-image at the time. Canadian peacekeeping forces have also served in the Congo and repeatedly in Egypt, Syria and Lebanon. The Canadian government has become very professional about the whole thing. Take 1964, when civil war broke out between the Greeks and Turks in Cyprus. Our external affairs minister went straight to the UN Secretary General. So I went, and I saw you tapped. And I said, now, we have to do something about this situation. Otherwise, there's going to be a war. Uh, I know what the Turks are planning, and you likely do. And he told me, no, I don't. Well, I said, I'm telling you, we know. Well, the people who had told us a war was brewing were the Americans. Lyndon Johnson would phone me. He did on more than one occasion. He phoned me about getting our troops to Cyprus under the UN. And we were the only people that could possibly get them there in time. Nobody else had contingents ready for UN service like we had. Nobody else had the air transport of its own to get the troops there. We had those troops in the air before Parliament authorized their dispatch. And they were on track, I think, within 24 hours. And the President was really amazed about that. He was filled with admiration at our ability to act so quickly. And he then said, now, what can I do for you? <laughs> and uh, I said, nothing at the moment, Mr. President. <laughs> but I had some... Uh, I had some credit in the bank. The pass goes in behind those bombs. Pearson had forestalled a war between two NATO allies, Greece and Turkey, and the Americans were duly grateful. In fact, most of our peacekeeping serves the interests of our own alliances, one way or another. But it is not an entirely cynical enterprise. Peacekeeping was a last-ditch invention by the disillusioned idealists of the 40s when they found their dream of world order through the UN collapsing around their ears. It gives a number of small and medium powers something useful to do, and it certainly provides good training for their soldiers. But above all, it reminds us that the UN was supposed to be more than a debating forum. It was intended to stop wars.
It hasn't been a great success. In 1974, the Greek government backed a coup in Cyprus aimed at annexing the island, and so the Turks invaded. Our peacekeeping troops just tried to stay alive until the two sides were ready for a ceasefire. But at least the Greeks and Turks could then use the presence of UN troops as an excuse to stop fighting. Peacekeeping falls far short of Mike Pearson's original vision of a UN army that could enforce peace, but it does do some good. A dozen years after the 1974 war in Cyprus, the UN force is still there, policing the new ceasefire line. The Canadian battalion has by far the most dangerous job, patrolling the no-man's land in the old city of Nicosia where the two sides are often only the width of a street apart. When did this sentry grass come on duty? Uh, it came on at 8.30 this morning, sir. And he should, he should be leaving around. 1230, sir. Okay, when is the last time a Turk officer was on the line? Uh, 7.30 this morning, sir. And nothing notably since then? No, sir. Cyprus is the only place where Canadian troops carry live ammunition every day. Well, it's uh, the, close to, the closest operational uh, role uh, the Army has presently, and it gives... Um, an opportunity for the young soldiers uh, to experience uh, a real a real mission and uh, get some satisfaction from that. It also allows the, uh, the junior leaders, the junior NCOs and junior officers to experience uh, a lot more independence in their command than they would back in Canada. And we have a policy of resolving problems at, low, at the lowest pro possible level. Yes, sir, my, my, my uh, soldier was very adamant about it. Who was it? Private Ball, sir. Okay. Uh, also, when they're doing the, the uh, work there, the, uh, the Turk force was, had some guys in the, uh, the corner by the water tower. Who was the officer? He wouldn't give me any, his name, sir. It was an was officer it, cadet in the second lieutenant. This fellow here? Yes, sir, that was the officer there. He would not uh, give me his name. I explained to him that uh, his presence there was creating tension and I wished for him to go. He said, I cannot talk to you. Okay. And so on and so forth. Go back. Go to company commander. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Take care. Bernetta. A few nights ago, um, we had about four or five calls from the, uh, the Greek National Guard complaining that Turkish forces were uh, shouting obscenities at them and making rude gestures. The sergeant went out and instead of attempting to talk to an officer or anybody, he, he got a hold of the local Turkish force sergeant. And between the two of them worked on an arrangement uh, where the Turkish force sergeant would keep his people quiet just uh, because they, they came to an agreement locally. No problem, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Taking some people who have been very critical of UN peacekeeping missions say that all that does is create a permanent situation of imbalance. Uh, why not pull out and let the people, whoever they are, have a go at each other, uh, and then a power balance will establish itself and peace will reign for 20 years. Uh, that is a very uh, cold-blooded approach. It's probably not incorrect in terms of logic. Uh, what it disregards, of course, is that in the process, you're going to kill an awful lot of people. Operations like this are gestures we make towards our old and fading hope that the UN could really change the way things are. Out here in the fringes of power, in places like Cyprus, the United Nations can do some good occasionally, but back in the world, in capitals like Moscow and Washington, the traditional dance of the great powers goes on. Nor do we in Canada believe that the UN is a practical way of ensuring our own security today. Instead, we've gone back to the old ways, too. Our armed forces aren't really meant for peacekeeping, though they do it very well. They're designed for fighting the Russians. Thirty-five years after Canada sent troops to Europe in the panic created by the Korean War, they're still there. If you'd predicted that in 1950, nobody in the Canadian government would have believed you. We certainly hadn't intended to send forces there when NATO was set up. First of all, they hope, we hoped that NATO itself, as a military, 
alliance would be temporary until you could get back to a universal system. Um, and this, even now, it was hoped that this would be holding the line while the Europeans were recovering, but once they had recovered, uh, our troops would presumably be withdrawn. There was no acceptance of the idea that they'd be there permanently. The Western Europeans recovered long ago. They have more wealth, better technology, and about as many people as the Russians and their allies. So you could reasonably ask why the Western Europeans still need American and Canadian troops to make themselves safe. But you won't find very many Canadian soldiers asking that question. They like their job. <laughs> the people around this country, you feel like you're wanted, you feel like you're appreciated here. You, uh, you know, they wave to you, you know, and uh, you know, they bring you food and coffee, and that makes you feel like at least you're doing something. Most of the army is in Canada, not here in Europe, but this is its spiritual home. Our soldiers' sense of worth, their whole identity is founded on being competent, well-respected professionals who have a role to play in the military big league. Canada's army will probably never be needed to defend our own territory. It's Europe that gives it meaning. Canadian soldiers probably know the town of Laar in Germany better than they know Vancouver or St. John's. It's a quiet little town, but we do lose a defense minister in Laar occasionally. And in wartime, we could lose a lot more. If there's ever a war in Europe, the Canadian Brigade in Germany will be sent to wherever the danger of a breakthrough is greatest. Its men will sell their lives very dearly, and it will probably be destroyed in less than a week. Nevertheless, it can be argued that our relative handful of troops and aircraft in Europe have a significance far beyond their mere numbers, because their loss would irrevocably commit Canada to fighting in another world war. Of course, we don't have to stay in Europe. If Canada ever concluded that the Soviets were not planning an invasion, or that the Western Europeans were big enough to look after themselves, then we could just pull our troops out. But in the meantime, a different kind of military commitment has been stealing up on us, one that may not be optional. Way back in 1938, as the Americans began to look at the world through the eyes of a great power, they noticed that Canada was important strategic territory for them. So President Roosevelt came up to Canada to see Mackenzie King and made a speech. The Dominion of Canada is part of the sisterhood of the British Empire. I give to you assurance that the people of the United States will not stand idly by if domination of Canadian soil is threatened by any other empire. King's response, which I think defines very much the Canadian position, instead of just saying, oh yeah, we'll go to defense of the United States if you're attacked, which would be a little out of proportion maybe. He said Canada would make sure that no enemy could attack the United States through Canada. And that's really our basic commitment. When American troops actually came to Canada during the Second World War, we were basically quite happy to have them. Mackenzie King just had to remind the Americans gently from time to time that we still ran the place. They went around, you know, up north of Edmonton and so on, in the Northwest Territories, just as though they owned the country. We finally established a, a special office of a, a sort of commissioner uh, that the Americans had to deal with, who was really a policeman to see that they didn't uh, take away two or three rivers or anything. <laughs> That's sort of we still have all our rivers, but the war did give us an ominous glimpse of the future. Washington and Moscow were still allies at the time. The U.S. was even sending military aid to the Russians. But we were the shortest air route between America and Russia. Where the planes got handed over was Edmonton. You would look up and you'd see a plane of some sort going overhead with a red star. The Americans would bring the planes up as far as Edmonton, 
And the Russians would come, I presume, over the pole, practically, and um, they would ha the planes would be handed over to them. An awful lot of vodka suddenly appeared in the town. Otto Walk could see what was coming. In 1944, a cabinet committee predicted that if the Americans and the Russians fell out after the war, Canada would become strategic territory. We then faced great pressure from Washington to maintain much stronger air defenses than we needed ourselves in order to defend the U.S. Everything came to pass just as predicted. The Americans and the Russians became enemies, and with the development of long-range bombers in the early 50s, Canada's position became vitally important. U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles made his requirements clear. Today, the air frontier lies in the polar areas. Thus, the frontier of freedom may be in the north rather than to the east or west. This provides our two countries with a common task of ensuring this continent against air attack from the north. In the new strategic context of the 1950s, the armament for Canada meant more than the familiar old business of sending troops to Europe. In 1953, the Soviets shocked the West by testing a hydrogen bomb and displaying a long-range jet bomber at the May Day Parade in Moscow. And in 1954, this plant in Malton started work on a new Canadian interceptor, the Arrow, designed to stop Russian bombers coming over the pole and heading for the United States. We were trying to maintain our independence in defense by keeping King's promise to stop anyone getting at the U.S. across our territory. But the Americans had very expensive tastes in air defense, so we gradually gave up trying. The Arrow was the last fighter designed in Canada, and a new government scrapped it in 1959. I just have a couple of words to say to Mr. Diefenbaker. Be a Canadian, buy Canadian. I would just like to say that I feel Mr. Diefenbaker has sold his country and his fellow Canadians down the river to American interests. All of us were fired on a loudspeaker on February the 20th, 1959, 11 o'clock. And the shock of it was very tremendous within the plant. The Canadian aircraft industry survived in the end by becoming a branch plant of the American industry. The Malton factory now makes bits and pieces for American planes. And in a sense, our Air Force survived by becoming a branch plant too. That's the institutional survival instinct at work. In the late 50s, our airmen made sure they got a piece of the action by entering a joint air defense command with the Americans. Our Air Force has an obvious interest in sharing the burden of defending the United States. But it's not so obvious why Canada as a whole should do so. If it's the Americans who want strong air defenses, why should we pay for them? Why not let them do it all themselves? <laughs> There's more than one way to skin a cat. Iceland suddenly discovered that it had become strategic territory about the same time Canada did, but its response was very different. The Icelanders quickly learned that you can't just ignore the fact that you're strategically important. Iceland was neutral during the Second World War, but we needed bases in mid-Atlantic, and we were also afraid it might fall into German hands. So in 1940, Canada and Britain sent troops to Iceland and occupied it. After the war ended, the occupation forces went home. But as soon as the Cold War began, Iceland became strategic territory again. Washington worried that the Russians might seize Iceland in wartime and dominate the North Atlantic. We are a very important country strategically, uh, being located where the traffic of U-boats uh, is heavy, into the uh, Barents Sea and into the north of the Atlantic. There was no way a little country like Iceland could avoid being occupied by one side or the other in a war, so they made their choice and joined NATO. 
But Iceland has no tradition of keeping its own armed forces, no military lobby looking for roles to justify its existence. So Iceland has a special deal with NATO. Most other countries in NATO would say that Iceland takes a free ride in defense. It belongs to the alliance, but it has no armed forces of its own. The Icelanders would put it differently, though. They'd say that, like Canada, the only military threat they really face comes from the fact that they're strategic territory in the confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union. So if it's American strategic interests that are being defended in Iceland, why not let Americans pick up the bill? That's exactly what the Icelanders do. They let the United States have a large military base here at Keflavik, though they actually didn't have much choice in the matter, but they contribute nothing towards the cost of the base, and they do their best to keep this foreign intrusion walled off from Icelandic society. If you put this into an American perspective and look at such a huge space in the neighborhood of Washington, in 50 kilometers away from Washington, of a base with five million foreigners, I mean, that would create some problems, of course. And that is the size of the base, 5,000 Americans in Keplavik. The Icelanders deal with the American presence by having as little as possible to do with them. A nation of only 250,000 people, which we are, has to look after themselves, their own language and their own culture. In the early days, they only let American troops into town in twos one day a week. The restrictions are a good deal looser now, but their approach still works. The Icelanders get away with their unusual strategy of letting the Americans defend them for free, and it's done no visible damage to their independence or their culture. But then Americans are foreigners here in a way they could never be in Canada. The Icelanders held their first parliament here at Thingvellir over a thousand years ago, and they were already a distinct self-conscious nation then. They're also insulated from American influences by several thousand miles of ocean and a language that nobody else can understand. Canada is a lot more vulnerable. If we followed the Icelandic example, just gave up our armed forces and let the Americans have bases all over Canada, on the perfectly reasonable argument that those bases are only really needed for American strategic reasons, then we'd be finished as a country. We're too close to the Americans and too much like them. Most of us don't even have the barrier of a separate language. If we gave up our sovereignty on such a basic matter as defense, we might as well give up entirely and apply to join the United States. Newfoundland is not all that different from Iceland, and when I was growing up there in the 50s, there were American bases all over the place. And frankly, I wanted to be an American too. My dream was to have a really big motorcycle and live in Brooklyn. I guess some people just have less culture than others. But I still don't think there's anything wrong with being American, or anything especially wonderful about being Canadian either. However, there are certain advantages to being Canadian. We're not a great power, so we're spared some of the delusions and obsessions that afflict our neighbor. Not that that will save us if the great powers go to war. La projection. If you look at a globe, you will see that we are the battlefield, or rather the space where the battle would be fought. There would be an exchange of intercontinental missiles carrying nuclear warheads. And we have to face facts. We will be the victims whether we are involved or not. Of course, the generally accepted view, both American and Russian, is that having heavily armed alliances will prevent the other side from starting a war, so nobody will be a victim. And a lot of people will tell you that the alliances must be working, because there hasn't been a world war for 40 years. There's a story about a man sitting in a train, tearing up little bits of paper and throwing them out the window. And somebody asked him, what are you doing that for? to keep the elephants away. But that's crazy, there's no elephants around here. Of course not, I'm keeping them away. <laughs> 
the idea that our alliances have prevented a world war is a bit like that. In fact, there's a whole lot of history to suggest that great power alliances usually do end up going to war. And the average time between that kind of wars over the past few centuries is around 50 years. Being Canadian makes it easier for us to see that. Our commitment to the great power game is less total. A move away from military alliances is likelier to start with people like us than with the great powers themselves. But Canada's strategic territory now, even if we wanted to quit our alliances, could we? Next time, we'll look at our relationship with the United States.